Welcome to Cozy Talks Live. I am running a few minutes late this evening. My text messages did not go out until a couple of minutes ago, and I do apologize for that. Uh, for those of you who are watching the replay, thank you for doing that. Please feel free to put replay into the comments section. Give me a shout out. And if you have a question for me, go ahead and put it in there as well. I do watch uh, the, the show and I keep an eye on the questions after I've closed the show down. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to give you guys a minute or two to jump on board. I realize I am without a drink this evening and I'm feeling... Uh, a little thirsty, so I wish I would have had a time to do that. Uh, so I'll just have to enjoy uh, your drinks uh, vicariously through you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go live on my Instagram channel and get that going. Excellent. All right, guys, I see a few of you guys popping on board. Uh, so as you come on board, do not be shy. Let me know who you are, where you're from, and what is in your mug. We got Eric listening in on the YouTube channel with his Sprite. We got Megan coming in. Good to see you, Megan. All right, guys, just as a reminder, I am broadcasting to Facebook, to YouTube, and to Instagram all at the same time because I'm fancy like that. All right, we got Victor coming in. We got Felicia. Felicia, I'm glad you're here. We got Emily here, just her root beer today. You always have fun drinks, Emily. Uh, we got Sherry from Orlando. Oh, Sherry, it's good to see you, man, drinking her iced coffee. We got Christy coming in. We got Pamela from upstate New York with her iced water. There's my boy Scott from West Virginia drinking his cold water. Safe Harbor International Network. Hey, good to meet you. <laughs> That's a very, uh, very uh, wordy handle there we got there. All right, so Victor is from Tennessee. We've got Barbara coming in from Minnesota. Beverly from Chesapeake Bay, Virginia. Welcome, Beverly. I'm glad you're here. I've got your question here ready to go. All right, let me just give a shout out to my folks on the Instagram channel. We've got Pam in there. We got Stoned Paper Towel. I love reading these guys. Smoke weed. All right, go for it, man. Uh, we got Tina and we got Shell Belly. <laughs> I love reading the Instagram handles. They're always so much fun. All right, guys, we've got a nice crew popping on board, so we are going to go ahead and get started. For those of you joining me for the first time this evening, welcome. My name is Kosi Bayoso. I'm a physical therapist here in Tampa, Florida, PT now for a little over three years, and my passion is working with the amputee and limb loss community. So for those of you who are kind of new to the show, and I, and I know we have a few newcomers this evening, thank you for joining in. Uh, this show is for you. Uh, so folks in the amputee community to me are the not only the amputees, but family members, caregivers, and clinicians. Uh, so many of you have emailed me your questions. Some of you have texted me your questions through the texting service. Uh, and that's what this show is about. It's about answering your questions. And if I don't have the answers, I will go and find them for you. Uh, we got Dick Devers from West Virginia. We got Randall Archer in San Diego. Randy was one of our big winners last week with the Click Medical Giveaway. So congratulations to you there. And congratulations and thank you guys again for participating participating uh, in last week's sponsored show with Click Medical. All right, let's get started. We have our first question that came in from Lenore and says, I'm a right above the knee amputee since 2002. I wore a tiny mechanical knee, a super light for years, recently received a new socket and a heavier knee, a 3R80. So that's the Autobach 3R80. And I believe it's their polycentric knee. I believe it is. The socket feels good, but my sound leg hurts around my knee, especially near my lower quad. I think I'm putting too much weight on my sound leg and it feels like I can't stand evenly when I stand. What can I do to correct this? And Lenore sent me a picture of her showing that she had, you know, her height was equal. Okay. Very, very common problem. Very common problem in my prosthetic users, especially if you're new to using a prosthesis and you haven't necessarily had a full physical therapy regimen, right? So it's only natural for our bodies to favor the stronger leg. And usually it's the anatomical sound leg, okay? Um, and yes, as, as Lenore is, is seeing, this can cause problems. This can cause what we call chronic overuse injury, where basically the sound leg is taking the full weight of the body. Right. So think about that for a second, guys, when we're walking and I talk about this in my gait talk, when I talk about the mechanics of the gait cycle, which, by the way, you can find on my YouTube channel. Our legs are holding the, the weight of our head, torso and arms. Right. And when we're walking, OK, we're using kind of one leg at a time in contact with the floor. Right. So it means that that one leg has to carry all that weight plus the weight of the other leg that's swinging through the air. So it's, it's a lot of weight. So if it's one leg doing all the work all the time, that's when we're going to get start getting chronic overuse injuries. OK, so one of the first things that I hammer into my patients when they come in through my doors is proprioceptive input. 
right? And putting weight into the socket. So what is proprioception for my newcomers? Any of any of my uh, my veteran listeners here, if you want to chime in the comment section and say, what is proprioception? I'm going to give you brownie points and bragging rights. All right. So proprioception is your brain's ability to know where it is in space, right? It's when you close your eyes and I tell you to give me a thumbs up. Hopefully these are the two fingers that you're holding up, right? So we lose that ability when we have an amputation, right? We lose the limb. And when we have a prosthesis put on it, the brain is not going to recognize it as its own limb. It's not going to do that. So it's going to favor the sound leg. So in early gait training, we really want to get that proprioceptive input so that the brain starts recognizing that prosthesis as its own and starts making those nice new neural connections that we like to see. OK, so it involves a lot of weight shifting activities. It involves putting a lot of weight into the socket. All right, guys, if you haven't been to my YouTube channel, especially my newcomers, go to my YouTube channel. It's under the same name. It's really easy to find me. I have videos there that really go into detail explaining the concept of proprioception and how you can start really working on it. OK, so when I have someone who comes in who has back pain, pain in their knee on their below the knee amputation side, pain in their sound knee, pain in their hips, pain anywhere in their body. The first thing I do is I try to correct, right, if they are favoring the sound leg. Because if we can shift that body weight over to the prosthetic side and get that person to start trusting that prosthesis, it really alleviates so much of that pressure on the sound leg. OK, but, you know, therein lies the rub is getting you to trust that prosthesis. And that does take time. But one of the first things that you can start doing is offloading by doing the weight shifting exercises. OK, I'm going to share my screen really quick because I'm going to show you the program that I developed where I do these weight shifting exercises. So for those of you who have the program, you're going to be able to follow along as well. So let me go ahead and share the screen. Here we go there and there okay so when you go to the website those of you who have my video subscription okay if you're an above the knee you can go to balance phase one i'm pretty sure that's where i have it here the weight shifts are right here okay so the square up that's the first exercise you want to do. And then you want to do the weight shifts. And in this video, I go into detail as to how to position yourself. What is the proper form? The why's behind it? All of that kind of good stuff. And for my below the knee, same thing. Balance, phase one. Okay. And here it is. Weight shifts for below the knee and square ups for below the knee. Okay. For those of you who have my book, it's also in here. You go to the balance phase one section and it's going to be there. Look, I even went to, Ooh, I went right to it. So for my above the knee book, it's on page 79 and page 80 right here. Okay. So that's one of the first things that you can start doing. If you're noticing that you're having a lot more pain on your sound leg. The other thing that you definitely need to do is you need to go back to your prosthetist, right? You need to see, is there something in that socket? that is causing discomfort, pain, that is not allowing you to put full weight into it, okay? And guys, these are just the simple things that you can do, but it is your responsibility to go to your prosthetist, make sure that the socket and the alignment are what they need to be. And then if you do have a chronic overuse injury, and honestly, I'd rather, if you, even before it develops into a chronic injury, get back to the physical therapist, okay? This is what we do. We, we try to prevent injuries, but we can also treat them and get you back uh, to where you need to be, all right? So I'm gonna put that website up there real quick. It's a long website name, all right? So for those of you who are interested in looking through some of those videos and to order the book, you can do that through that website right there. All right, let's see what else we got here. We got uh, Pastor David says, deleted that other name, don't know how that happened. <laughs> Hey there, Dave. Good to see you. We got Denise coming in from North Carolina with her bottled water. I'm missing my orange shirt. I know I tried wearing and I have like my orange, 
my orange running shorts on. <laughs> so I'm trying to put the orange back into it. I know I feel terrible. I have, I know April is Limb Loss Awareness Month and every year I've done something for Limb Loss Awareness Month. Um, so I do have a little something I want to, I want to share with you guys, a little surprise that I'm going to share for you guys for Limb Loss Awareness Month. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll get that going there. So we got Linda coming in from New York. Thank you for watching Linda. Oh, I'm glad you liked it, Randy. Hey, Sean, what's going on, man? Uh, Brenda says, pain is everywhere, but both legs are gone. Yeah. Uh, Marianne says, beautiful day in South Dakota. Uh, you're welcome, Lenore. I hope that gets you kind of started on the right place. Um, and again, I would really encourage you, go go see a physical therapist because they can really help you determine, okay, yes, this is, a, this is an injury that we need to do a little bit more extensive rehab work with. Um, but for sure, you know, starting to put that weight into that prosthetic side and starting to trust it. And because you are an above the knee amputee, and you're using a mechanical knee, you really need to learn the mechanics of using that knee so that you can trust it and be comfortable with it. You need to be comfortable flexing that knee. You need to be comfortable letting it really just flex and swing out in front of you. And then when the heel hits the floor, be able to really pull back and get that knee extended um, so that you have that good stability. And that takes, you know, it's a lot of trust you got to put in that, in that leg uh, and it takes time. So if you haven't had treatment with a physical therapist, I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to go do that. Uh, Christy says, I put more weight in my prosthetic leg. I need knee surgery in the left knee. How do I get more weight on the other foot? Let me reread that. I put more weight on the prosthetic leg. Is your prosthetic leg on the right, Christy? Could you just clarify that for me, please? I want to make sure I've got, I'm thinking of the right the right legs and right knees. All right. Emily asks, I am going to explain this as best as I can. Whenever I'm at the parallel bars trying to walk, it's like my legs don't want to move. I'm starting to wonder if it's because my legs can't feel the connection to the floor by me just holding on to the parallel bars. Before amputation, I walked with lost strand crutches, and I feel like the crutches in my hands as I walked made me feel the ground better than just holding on to the parallel bars. Um, because of spina bifida, it's almost as if my crutches attached to my arms were like my legs. Not sure if that's an issue with proprioception or whatever, but my body doesn't feel like it knows what to do when I'm at the parallel bars. And I feel like my feet are stuck on the floor. No, that's actually a very um, astute perception there, Emily. So you, you, you said it right in using the loft strand crutches. And guys, the loft strand crutches, those are the ones that go across your forearm. They have that nice cuff in the forearm and you hold it with your hands down here, right? It is an extension of your arms. And in essence, they were working as your legs. Okay. And the reason why you felt the floor more is because the loft strand crutch is hitting the floor, right? It's giving you that proprioceptive input. You're absolutely right. Okay. Parallel bars aren't doing that, right? Parallel bars are great because you can do all sorts of crazy things because they're super sturdy and they're not moving anywhere, but that's the key. They're not moving anywhere, right? There's no two points of contact on the floor every time you take a step with the parallel bars, right? They're theoretically, they're just kind of in the air, right? So if you were someone like yourself that prior to your, prior to your amputation, you were dependent upon that proprioceptive input with the loft strands and you don't have that now. So I'd be curious to see, Emily, if you're with your physical therapist and if you had the proper guarding, like you had two people, one person on each side guarding you, and if they were to allow you to try to take a few steps with the loft strand crutches in a safe way to see if maybe that kind of triggers some of that muscle memory that you had prior to your, prior to your amputations, right? Okay. Uh, let's see. Lenore says, I don't trust the prosthetic knee yet because my old knee was so small and I always had to anticipate it bending. Yes. And guys, you know, I've said this several times on the show, whenever you're switching componentry, and this is even for my advanced experienced amputees, you know, if it's, if it's not the exact same knee and exact same foot, you, you need to be retrained, right? Cause it's going to throw things off. It's going to make the mechanics of your gait cycle a little bit different, Certainly, if you're going something from like a single, perhaps I'm, I'm just guesstimating here, Lenore, that maybe you had a single axis knee, which is going to be lighter than a polycentric knee, right? And the mechanics of how they work are going to be different. Yeah. How you get that knee to bend and the safety feature in that knee and when it hits the floor, there's going to be different ways on how it activates and how it bends and how it works. And you have to retrain your brain to learn those mechanics. 
Um, it's, it's a nice, it's a very nice mechanical knee that they gave you, right? But you want to be able to use it and not just kind of ride it in first gear, you know, burning out the clutch the whole time. Okay. So yeah, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know this in order to let you know, it's not you. There's nothing wrong with you, right? You are correcting thinking, why is this weird for me to start using this knee now when I was walking prior? Okay. So definitely get that physical therapy uh, to help you learn how to use that knee so you can really get moving. Hey, hey, it's my Limb Kind Foundation crew right there. That's Rob Shulman there. Shout out to him, man. Glad to see you on board. Uh, let's see. Victor says, so I've had my prosthesis since October 2023, but have been unable to wear it because of a sore on Mr. Stubby, the right BK. My problem is now when I use my walker, my left leg is starting to give out. Instead of a hop, it's more like I'm dragging it. Anything I can do to build it back up. Yeah. And this is something that I struggle with because it's like when my amputees are sidelined and they can't use their prosthesis, you know, you still want to be able to get around. And a lot of folks, they don't like using a wheelchair and they, they feel like they can get around a lot easier with a walker or with crutches. But, you know, like you said, Victor, it can create a lot more stress on that on the intact leg, right? And hopping on it, I mean, you're just basically just pounding the joints in your sound leg. And we really don't want to do that. We want to protect that sound leg as much as we can, right? So a couple of things. Uh, number one, consider resting the leg. If you do have a wheelchair, I would consider just trying to use the wheelchair a little bit more during your day just to take the weight off that sound leg. OK, the other thing is strengthening the sound leg. Right. A lot of times my patients will be like, OK, I've been working on strengthening my residual limb and getting it strong, which is great. But she also got up to give some love to that sound leg, especially those of us who are aging, which that is all of us. Right. We still have to maintain the muscle in that sound leg. If anything, we got to beef it up a little bit more um, as much as we would ideally want to use each leg equally. Right even with the best of physical therapy and the best of training, you're always going to favor that sound leg just a little bit more. And we want to protect that and strengthen the muscles. And the muscles that I would focus on would be, you know, the hip muscles, so the gluteal muscles, and then moving your way down. Okay. A lot of studies are showing that if we, people who have injuries in their uh, ankles and knees, we can trace it back to hip muscle weakness right? Kind of makes sense, right? If you're, if the center of your body is weak, then everything down the chain is going to have to take more stress, more work. Okay. So this applies to your sound leg. So take a look at your, and again, guys, physical therapy. I cannot say it. I know I need like my four soap boxes here on, on my profession here. Right. Um, so physical therapy. And again, if you don't necessarily have someone in your area who is an amputee specialist, right? You just need to find the physical therapist that's willing to work with you and help you. Anybody who has a PT license in any state here in the United States can put together a strengthening program for you. Okay, I'm going to hold my I'm going to hold my colleagues accountable, right? They can do that for you. They may not have the experience of working with the prosthetic device, but they can certainly create a strengthening protocol for you. Yeah? Okay. Coops Gaming says, I try to watch even when I have to work. I always get great of all. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for joining in. I appreciate that. Hey, Harsh. Cheers with the watermelon juice. Oh, that's unusual. I like that. Um, so Lenore says, yes, it was the your previous knee was small and light. And then you also have a new foot. So yeah, you've got a lot of new action going on there, Lenore. So you definitely want to learn how to use all the bells and whistles of your new setup right there. The other thing, Lenore, obviously, you know, there's a difference in the weight between your first knee and now this knee. If you feel like even over the course of time, it's still feeling very heavy, have your prosthetist check the suspension. Um, and that's something that whenever somebody comes in telling me, gosh, my prosthesis feels so heavy. And I tell them, well, part of it is you got to get, you got to get used to it, right? Your brain's interpreting it as heavy and you just, you got to get used to it. But the other part of it is making sure the suspension is on point. Okay. We have some of the, like, you know, one of the heaviest knees on the market, it's called the power knee and it's made by Oser. I love that knee. I'm really starting to like that knee, but one of the knocks that people say, oh, it's a very heavy knee. And I'm like, yes, but if it's, if the suspension is done properly, people don't feel the weight, right? I've seen, I've seen this one particular gal that I know that she just whizzes around on the power knee and she's all of five feet tall. Oh, 
just lost my lighting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess the battery, I need to charge the battery on my lighting. All right. So, um, Anyways, going back to the power knee, heavy knee, but you know, the one gal, I remember using it, she's five feet tall, you know, maybe a hundred pounds soaking wet. And she's whizzing up and down because she has a really well-made socket and good suspension. Okay. So just things to kind of keep in the back of your head. All right. We got Jerry Ann coming in from Arizona with cinnamon roll coffee. Y'all are killing me, man. I didn't have time to make myself anything to drink tonight. You guys got some good stuff going on. We got Don coming in. There's my paramedic right there. Uh, let's see, post-workout protein shake. There we go. Uh, we got John coming in. Great. Thank you for coming. Uh, David says, I've become seriously aware of how critical a good fitting so socket, I can't speak tonight, guys, I'm sorry, helps in facilitating great proprioception. Absolutely. One little thing off in the socket and uh, yeah, no, you're not kidding. You're not kidding. Um, and I will say it was interesting. So I had a really phenomenal well, I got to give a shout out tonight. Um, I had the honor of speaking at the Johns Hopkins Limb Loss Symposium yesterday. Um, and, and guys, I can't tell you, I felt like a country bumpkin in the big city. I It was such an honor to be able to say I spoke at Johns Hopkins. I was walking around with a big goofy smile on my face all day yesterday after this talk. And I was able to do this talk with one of my colleagues. Her name is Lisa, and she's an amazing physical therapist out at Walter Reed. Um, and we were talking about the differences between military health care Care and civilian health care for our amputees and those who are uh, undergoing osteointegration. So uh, if anybody out there is listening from Johns Hopkins, I just want to say thank you again for allowing me to do that talk and to Lisa and to the folks at Walter Reed. Thank you for, for the support there as well. Yeah, no, it was like, I was like, oh my gosh, I got to speak at Johns Hopkins. Wow. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, okay. Back to the questions. So Beth asks, and actually, Beth, let me look up to see if I got the answer to your question. Okay, so Beth asks, how does a prosthetist become trained in adding RevoFit to a socket? So hang on, let me get my box of toys. Hang on a second, guys. It's right here. All right, so all right, we've got the RevoFit, right? Uh, this is the adjustable socket system that is made by Click Medical. They are one of the sponsors of my show, and I love their product. I know a lot of you guys are huge fans. We did a, we did a show with them just last week, actually, on their new coding system, right? So the training for this is available on their website. Um, they have, it's called Click Academy. I've actually gone through all the courses myself. And I mean, I, I, I don't know how to build it because I'm not a prosthetist, but it was really interesting watching all those videos. So they do have a lot of continuing education on those videos on how to construct the socket. And they also, I can say, you know, just from personally, from working with Click Medical for the past almost three years now, they have a really wonderful support team. Uh, I know there've been times where even the creator, Joe Mahan, has personally called a prosthetist to help walk them through how to put it together and to help them troubleshoot everything. So they really do have a really great customer service um, and also service with uh, their clinicians as well to help them. Okay. Um, as far as Beth, your question on how it works with suction, uh, especially if there's an outer sleeve that covers the majority of the socket, I'm waiting to hear back from them. I apologize. I sent them that question today and I know they're going to get back to me. One of my first guesses would be is that they would put the dial towards the bottom of the socket so that it doesn't interfere with the sleeve that goes over it. So that's one of my first guesses, but I'll get back to you on that question. Okay. Good question though. Hey, let's see. We got Dr. Jill coming in from Green Bay, drinking her Mandarin Jarrito. Nice. Uh, Lenore says, I'm putting weight on my sound leg more because I feel like my pelvis on my limb side is behind my left sound leg pelvis. Very cool. You spoke of I know. I'm still on a high from it. Okay. So if you feel like your left, okay, your side is behind. Okay. Here's another thing that could be going on, Lenore. And again, get thee to a physical therapist because they're going to be the ones to really be able to tell you. Sometimes with our pelvis, it's actually not one big piece. Where's Bob? Here's Bob. Come here, Bob. Your turn. Guys, for those of you who are new to the show, this is Bob. He is my uh, somewhat reluctant and always snarky uh, model. Okay. So Bob's pelvis is one piece because, you know, I was kind of cheap and I didn't get the, the, the really movable skeleton, but there's, it's made up of several pieces and they're just very closely knit together with the joint here with the sacrum, the tailbone right here. Right. So sometimes there can be little shifts 
in these pieces, different pieces of the pelvis, right? And it can cause a misalignment, especially in my women, okay? And especially the women who have had children, right? Because when we have children, our pelvis expands. It does all sorts of fun things to accommodate for the child during the pregnancy and during the labor process, right? So we can see shifts in pelvis. Another thing that can happen is if you're not aligned properly in the socket, that could cause a shift in your pelvis as well. And then also weakness, right? So this, this feeling that you have where you feel like one side is not really picking up the slack the way it should, it could be due to some of these issues going on. It could also be just the weakness from the gluteal muscles, okay? But again, these are all issues that can be um, worked around and sometimes even completely resolved with good physical therapy services. I know, killing, beating a dead horse here with that one. Um, let's see, Nikki says, Earl from California is wearing a shoe on your hand. Is wearing a shoe on your prosthetic side a must have for everyday use like the Rush H2O that has a rubber sole instead of a foot shell? Um, so I usually recommend, yes, um, wearing your shoes at all times because it just preserves um, the foot, you know, the foot shell. Um, you know, and, and there's some, some folks that because they have, you know, they have particular rules in their household or they have customs that they don't want shoes from the outside coming into the house. So usually for those folks, I just say, okay, have a pair of, of slippers that are safe for you to wear inside the house so that you can just prevent all that wear and tear on the foot. Now, if you have something like the Rush H2O with the rubber sole, um, actually, you know what? I am not familiar with the Rush H2O. I, you know what I was thinking of? I was thinking of the Breeze Foot by College Park. I completely can mixed up in my brain. So College Park has a foot called the Breeze Foot and it's meant for water. So it has, it's a very simple foot, nothing fancy, and it has a little port on the bottom too, so the water can come out. So I mean, yes, if you're going to the beach, if you're going to the pool, and you want to walk around with both of your feet bare, then, you know, that's what that foot is meant for. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I try to recommend folks to, to keep their shoes on. Um, it, it just, again helps with the wear and tear of the foot. Now, there's hundreds of feet out there on the market, guys. I do not know every single foot on the market. I will be the first one to say it. I actually have two blogs, and yes, this is a very shameless plug right now. I actually have two blogs dedicated to prosthetic feet, and it's on my website along with the podcast. So go listen to it. Um, but basically, I, I talk about how are the different classifications of prosthetic feet. So could there be a foot out there on the market that I don't know about that you can walk around barefoot and it's meant to do that? Yes, quite possibly there is. I just haven't heard about it um, specifically, other than, like I said, the breeze foot for pool and beach. Hey, let's see. Shelly says, bummed, we'll have to watch on replay storm going through and internet is bad. All right, get that storm weathered out, Shelly. Okay. Mm. Christy, I did not forget about your question, darling. Let me go back to it. Okay, so I put more weight on the prosthetic leg. I need knee surgery in the left knee. How do I get more weight on the other foot? Okay, so again, weight shifting exercises. Okay, and what I love again about these weight shifting exercises that I shared earlier is that it can be done by above the knee, below the knee, unilateral, bilateral amputees. It can be done by beginners. That's actually the first exercise I give people when they first put their prosthesis on. It can be done safely in your home, in your kitchen counters when you have two sturdy surfaces. So it's a, it's, a, it's an exercise that's very applicable to almost everybody. Um, and again, it's something to help you just start putting weight into that other side that needs it. Okay. Uh, Brian sent in a question that says, my, my foot has been slow to heal up. I would like to know what others have done. Um, and this question, it, it struck a particular chord with me because in the past couple of weeks on Facebook, I was seeing uh, a certain particular group um, where a few people were posting some pretty intense pictures of their wounds. Uh, and it was something that it just, it made me cringe a little bit as a clinician, not because of the wound. I'm used to seeing wounds. That's not, you know, what made me cringe. What made me cringe is that they're asking for help on Facebook. Um, and again, these Facebook groups are wonderful for support. And I know that people who try to offer advice on these support groups do it with a good heart and a compassionate heart. But Facebook is not the place where you should be going to ask for advice on open wounds. Okay. It's not. 
Um, and it's probably one of the reasons why I created this show is to have a place on Facebook where you could ask these questions to a licensed professional like myself. Okay. But basically, if you have an open wound, you need to get a doctor. Okay. Uh, if you have an open wound, it's something that you need to have addressed, especially, and I'm not talking about just like the, the occasional blister or the occasional little, you know, uh, broken skin, that little minor things that happen with the use of a socket that happens over time. And you should be taught how to manage those things by your prosthetist and by your physical therapist. I'm talking about these wounds that don't heal wounds that are happening after surgery, where the surgical wound does not heal properly wounds that can sometimes occur with certain osseo integration procedures, right? These big chronic wounds, you need to get to the doctor. You need to get back to the surgeon. Okay. If it's the case of a surgical wound, you go back to the surgeon. Okay. If this is a wound that has cropped up, then you need to go to your doctor and ask for a wound care team consult. Okay. And a lot of times when I receive these questions, people are not aware that there is such a thing as a wound care specialist. Okay. They do exist and they're everywhere. So it's not, it's not as it's not an uncommon thing, okay? And your primary care doctor may or may not know of a wound care team, but that is something that you can actually Google and say, wound care team in my area or wound care specialist in my area and get yourself a referral to go, okay? These usually consist of a doctor who specializes in wound care. Oftentimes it's an infectious disease or a general surgeon who does this. Um, it's a nurse, a lot of nurses that are trained to be wound care specialists. Physical therapists can be wound care specialists. Yours truly did it here for many years, okay? But you want to have this looked after. The wounds that especially make me go, oh, are the ones that people say, oh, it's like a hole and I feel like I can stick stuff into it. Even though it's not very big on the outside, I can feel like I can stick something into it, okay? Those are the wounds that you especially want to get looked at because you don't know what's going on inside and you need to get it checked out. Yes? Okay. Okay. Oh, I appreciate that, Coops. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. All right. So here's the other question. Um, Beverly, I hope you're still on and thank you so much for your patience for waiting. Uh, she says, and she gave me permission to share this information. Uh, she says, my 69-year-old veteran husband had an above-the-knee amputation on January 2nd after a very long course of vascular issues and trying to save the leg, right? Recuperated nicely, but now the other leg is in trouble. Um, and it looks like he's much stronger now with physical therapy. Um, and they are thinking that he'll recover better than before because he's stronger and not fighting the infection um, and that he is ready to go ahead and have that second leg amputation to have better quality of life. And the question is, do they go home and then come back to have that amputation done versus having that amputation done right away? Okay, so Beverly, thank you for being here. So guys, this is a really big question. And I'm sometimes hesitant to answer these questions because again, I'm not the clinician, I'm not the surgeon on board, but I can at least offer a lot of hypothetical scenarios and hopefully give you questions to ask and take back to your team. Because I know that there's many of you here that might be facing this now or sometime in the future. Unfortunately, when it comes to vascular related amputations, meaning you had an amputation due to diabetes, um, vascular, peripheral vascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, these statistics are high that you might have a second amputation within five years. Okay. So first things first, for those of you who fall into this, into this category, I always encourage you, please, please, please keep up with your vascular surgeon, your vascular doctor to continually test your other leg to make sure it is staying healthy and that they can jump on any problem right when it happens. Okay. Sometimes these problems happen no matter how, you know, how, no matter how good the patient is at taking care of themselves, the disease process just continues. Okay. So in the case of this particular gentleman, the first thing you need to, and I know that you've probably already done this, Beverly, is truly determine, is there any chance of saving that leg? And that might sound like master of the obvious, but I've actually had a couple of local cases where the person was in a hospital that was not experienced working with amputees and they wanted to amputate the leg and the leg was capable of being saved. And we were able to refer them to a hospital that did have amputee care 
uh, clinicians there. Okay, so do your due diligence and really ask your doctor to walk you through why they think the amputation needs to happen and they should be able to explain this to you, okay? Second thing, is this an amputation that can wait a little bit of time or is this an amputation that needs to happen right away? You know, how is that infection looking like? Do you have a little bit of time? OK, in some cases you don't and you don't have a choice on that and you have to have it done right away before that infection becomes a systemic infection and you become septic and die from that. Right. So these again, these are just questions to ask your surgeon. Have these conversations. OK. And then in the course of waiting, you know, if the surgeon says, yes, we are able to wait, then the next question you need to ask is, well, if we wait, are we in danger of losing more of the limb? OK, so it sounds like this gentleman, you know, he has an above the knee amputation now. And the other side, it sounds like it might be a below the knee amputation, which is good. We want to preserve that knee because that's going to give him an advantage when he walks with the prosthetic devices. OK, and again, this you know, it's a pretty complicated decision, guys, and it's a, it's a decision that needs to be done with the entire team involved. This is where I really advocate, and this is what you can do as a patient. Sometimes as a patient, you don't feel like you have a lot of control over this situation, right? If the doctor says the leg's got to go because it's either that or your life, you know, then the leg has to go. Um, but you need to have not only the surgeon and the nurses involved, but you want to have the physical therapist on your team involved in this conversation so that they can tell you, yes, your mobility will in fact get better if we just do this now or if we can wait and improve the mobility a little bit more. Okay. And again, there's a lot of multi-factors in Beverly. I hope I'm, I'm able to give you a little bit more empowerment here with, with the questions that you can ask. Um, the good news is, is if your husband was getting good at using that above the knee prosthesis, then learning how to use the below the knee prosthesis is going to be easier because he has his anatomical knee on that side. Okay. And as long, and you made a very good point, you know, his body is not going to hopefully be fighting that infection because that is incredibly draining, especially in our older population. And when I mean older, I mean over 50, which is not old to me, but in medical terms, yeah, it, it, it causes a huge drain on the body. Um, I obviously, you know, it sounds like you have a really good team surrounding your husband, especially if he's a veteran and he's being taken care of the VA. The VA's, you know, they've got wonderful, wonderful resources there. Um, so it's, it's making sure that he continues to have this therapy uninterrupted. Now, there may be a point in time, Beverly, once he has that second amputation, he's not going to be able to walk on the above the knee side, if that makes sense. Like he won't be able to use it until he's ready to wear and be fitted for the below the knee prosthesis. I hope that makes sense. In the meantime, however, physical therapy can continue to work on him with his mobility. Okay, there's a whole lot that you can do with keeping his mobility active and also keeping his strength active and getting him ready to use both prosthetic devices again. Okay. I hope this answered your question. Um, please keep me posted on your husband's progress. I really would like to know how he's doing. All right. And guys, for those of you, let me just go ahead and put my email up there. For those of you who are new to the show, this is my email address. Uh, sometimes it takes me a day or two or three to get to all the emails because I answer all the emails myself and I do get several per week. Um, but this is where you can email me your questions. And again, if I don't have an answer for you, I will try my hardest to find someone who can, who can give you these answers. No, and it's incredible, Beverly, when you have, and again, I became a physical therapist. You know, I don't like physical therapy because I'm a physical therapist. I became a physical therapist because I saw uh, the, the, the incredible changes in quality of life um, that having good therapy treatment can do for people. Um, and it's something that I will always continue to fight for and advocate for, um, especially for the amputee population. Uh, so, you know, it was interesting. Like I mentioned, I had that talk at Johns Hopkins yesterday and we were comparing military and civilian health care. Um, and, you know, with the veterans, thank goodness, we have really good programs, you know, set up for them and with amputee care, especially so. Um, so, yeah, but I think if you've already seen the strides that your husband has made so far, um, and that's with the odds are still kind of stacked on him with the current infection and having to have that second side done, he's going to continue to do well. He's going to continue to do well. Um, so, and I wish you the best of luck. Yep. The Virginia hospital. Yep. Yep. Hey, okay, let's see. 
Let me scroll back here just a bit. Emily said, I wouldn't be here without wound care. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy saved my right leg in 2015. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. I did, you know, I worked for several years. I've been a PT for, you know, 23 years. I've worked pretty much in every specialty of physical therapy. I've, I've worked in it at some point or another. And my top three favorites are, you know, amputee, burn trauma, and wound care. Um, I really enjoyed, and a lot, there's a lot of overlap there between those three specialties, but those were definitely my top three favorites right there. It, Tom says, good evening. Good to see you here though, man. Good to see you. Uh, let's see. Don says, got approval for three sets of legs. What? From my uh, WCB insurance, one ProFlex pivot for work, two ProFlex torsion for pleasure, and for water legs. It took seven months for approval. Holy smokes, Don. I think, are you in Canada? Is that, is that, wow, three sets of legs. That's incredible. Incredible. Um, no, Beverly, and, and I'm glad you're, you're getting these thoughts and hopefully, you know, just gathering more, more thoughts and questions that you can take. Uh, let's see. Mm, David says, I know this wound sepsis drill well, nothing to play around with was not resolving itself. And my surgeon had me in the hospital before I could link. Yeah. Um, and with my newer amputees, you know, when, when they, when I worked with them in the past, I tend to be a little more like helicopter mom. Cause I'm just like, okay, I need to get to know your skin and I need to know what your skin is going to do. And I need to know it's going to behave itself before I trust your skin. <laughs> So when it comes to learning how to use the prosthesis and making sure the skin stays healthy, and if we have any wounds, you know, addressing them immediately. And guys, don't take it for granted that every clinician you see is going to know what to do with a wound. I, I, I'm sorry to say that I've had some people come to my clinic from their prosthetist office with gaping, draining wounds, and the prosthetist said nothing. And again, I've seen some PTs who have also really screwed up in that area as well. So it's not me just picking on prosthetists um, and even occasionally doctors. Okay. So there should, you know, open wounds, chronic wounds, no bueno and not acceptable. Okay. And you need to go see a wound care specialist. Uh, let's see. Shannon says, hello, greetings from Maryland. I'm a John Hopkins PT. Oh, I'm rehab patient. I'm a double amputee. I lost my limbs after con contracting COVID first wave. Wow. While on the ventilator, I became septic. And as a result, I have a right above the knee and a left below the knee. PT was going great, legs fitting and working well. However, due to AVN and other health issues, I recently had a right shoulder reversal replacement. My goodness, those are, those are intense. As expected, I've been regressed with my standing walking. My right prosthetic is fine. But when I'm experiencing more tightness, discomfort while standing prolonged periods of time with my left while in my left limb. Sorry, let me just make sure I'm getting these limbs straight. Um, so right above me and left below. Okay. Um, my left prosthetic fits well. I'm thinking it's because of the regression due to me not standing or walking for a year while tending to my shoulders. Would I benefit from the weight shifting exercise regime? Yes. Um, and Shannon, if you don't mind my asking, who is your physical therapist at John Hopkins? I probably know him. Um, so what I would encourage you to do, Shannon, is, you know, once that shoulder and that, that is no, that is no small feat to recover, not only from the bilateral limb loss, but also from the reverse, uh, total shoulder replacement. Those are so, you know, congratulations for getting over that hump. Um, and yes, it may take a little bit of retraining, you know, because in the time that you were not using your legs, right, the soft tissue in your residual limbs is going to change a little bit. You might have a little bit of atrophy. You might have it, maybe it puffed up a little bit with a little bit of limb volume with some edema. Okay. So these changes are going to happen. Um, and I certainly would think it warrants having and uh, going back to that physical therapist that taught you how to walk with those prosthetic legs, which is if, if it is who I think it is, then you've got one of the best PTs, uh, best PTs in the United States working with you um, to just brush up on those gait mechanics. And also, yes, because you had a difference in your shoulders, you know, learning to incorporate trunk rotation and arm swing back into your gait pattern, especially as a bilateral amputee right? So it's all connected, right? And it's all something that you want to get back to working normal again, as best as you can. Hang on, let me just, I realize I haven't checked in with my Instagram folks. Oh, thank you, Shell Belly. She liked my t-shirt. Uh, let's see, Fly Ann says, I think this leads to what makes a good fit for your socket. Absolutely. All right. So we had a lot of folks coming in. We got 
Someone in, coming in from Morocco. Nice. All right. Let me go ahead and scroll through. Hey, Van Gregory's here. Uh, let's see. Sean says, I didn't have a choice with my leg and green was setting in. So there was no saving the leg. It was at the leg or me. Yeah. And that's usually the first question I ask. I've had a you know couple of people over the past few years that you know locally they knew they know about what I do, and they would call me and they would say, "My loved ones in the hospital, they're wanting to amputate. What do I do?" And I'm like, "Well, the first question I ask is, well, is it their life in danger? Because <laughs> if their life is in danger and they have sepsis, then yeah, you got to go do that. And if not, these are the questions you want to ask your surgical team. So yeah, it's it's." We got Alex. Oh, Alex, man, we haven't seen you here in a while. I'm glad to see you. Good to see you. All right. Uh, so Don says, because my injury happened at work, they provide the work, leisure, and water legs. Good. And that's how it should be. It shouldn't be a luxury to have that. So I'm very glad that you're getting that, Don. Um, so Shannon says, my PT team is Ed, Tim, and Mackenzie. Ed is my man. Ed, Ed is like one of the best physical therapists I've ever met and just amazing human being, Shannon. Um, so again, Shannon, I would, I would recommend just give Ed a call and say, hey, Ed, if he, if he does, if he's not already aware of what's going on, just say, hey, this is what's been going on. Can I come in and see you for a session just to kind of brush up on things and, and make sure everything is okay? Oh, you have a phenomenal team, Dr. Gonzalez. She's wonderful. Uh, and Mark, oh, Mark. And yeah, Shannon, you are hooked up. That is like the dream team right there with your Dr. Gonzalez, Mark Hopkins uh, from Dankmeyer Prosthetics. He was actually, I was chatting with him yesterday and with Ed. So you're in really good hands, Shannon, and you deserve to have that best care. Uh, let's see. Don says, looking at the Revo lock for the work and leisure legs. All right. So guys, I've got a little surprise for Limb Loss Awareness Month. I know I haven't been doing as much on social media as I should, and I do apologize, but I did want to do kind of something special. So one of the big things that I started this year was my podcast and my blog and my cheat sheets, right? So everybody knows what a podcast is. Everybody knows what a blog is, but cheat sheets are something I just kind of came up with. So my blogs are, you know, they got a lot of information in them. So, you know, the first blog I wrote was everything you need to know about prosthetic legs. The other blog was how to choose a prosthetic foot. And then the current one, I just, I just, uh, posted this week was cracking the insurance code, right? And explaining to you how insurance coding works for physical therapy services and for your prosthetic devices, right? So then I create what I call cheat sheets. It's like a quick reference sheet of everything that's on these blogs and podcasts. And it's kind of nice because you can just take these to your process disappointment and have this conversation and, you know, using your cheat sheets, right? Okay. So here's what I need from you. We're going to, we're going to do like a little contest giveaway for the month of April. Okay. Anytime you share my podcast or my blog, okay. On Facebook or Instagram. Okay. I will put your name into a raffle and I do these a lot. So those of you who've been watching my show, you guys know I do raffles and giveaways and we have a great time doing it. At the end of the month, I'm going to pick a winner who's going to get a book and a year long subscription to my video program. It's $120 gift for the giveaway. Here's the thing and listen closely to this part because this is the only way I'm going to be able to give you your raffle ticket. When you share my blog or my post, I need you to tag me. <laughs> if you don't tag me, then I'm not going to know that you shared it. So whether you share it to your personal page or to your Facebook support group or on your Instagram story, because you can share links there now. Okay. Yeah, I know it's $120 value, like between my book and the, the subscription to my video program. Okay. So it's a pretty nice little gift there, right? All right, guys. So you have to share the link to one of my podcasts or one of my blogs. I don't care which one you do, just share one out. And you can find those links on my Cozy Talks on the main website, CozyTalks.com. There's a little tab that says blog, little tab says podcast. You just have to copy and paste it, the URL. Okay. And then tag me. So once you tag me, I will click like so that you know that I've seen it and I'm going to give you a raffle entry. For every time you share, I will give you a raffle entry. So if you share 50 times in this month, I will give you 50 raffle entries. Does that sound like a deal? Thumbs up? Does that sound like a good giveaway, right? Yeah? Yeah? 
Guys, I'm going to even sweeten the pot. If I get 100 shares, I will do two giveaways. And it could be 100 shares from the same person. That person's got pretty good odds of winning. <laughs> Sean says yes. Thank you, Sean. All right, so I'm going to say it again for those of you who may have just joined in right now, okay? Here's the giveaway. You have to take a link from my podcast or from my blog and share it out on Facebook or on Instagram. I don't care where, but just on one of those two platforms, right? It can be to your private support group or it can be to your personal page. Share it. Maybe write a cute little song. Hey, listen to this blog or read or read this blog or listen to this podcast and then tag me. Make sure you tag Cozy Talks and that way I can give you credit for that raffle, okay? And if I get 100 shares, I'm going to do two giveaways. Yes? All right. Awesome, guys. <laughs> And guys, thank you again for those of you who share out my live shows to your groups and things like that. I really appreciate that. That is how we get the word out about the show and the benefits of the show and people can ask their questions and things like that. So thank you for those of you who have been providing me that support for so many years. All right, guys, it has been a great show. A lot of great questions here. Once again, if I did not get to your question, I do apologize. Please send it to me at my email. There we go. All right, and I will get you those answers. Thank you guys. All right, guys, so now I wanna start seeing you share and tag me, okay? Yes? All right. All right, guys, with that, I am closing. Ooh, next week, Ronnie Dixon from Prosthetic Orthotic Associates of Tennessee is coming on my show. It is Ask the Prosthetist Night, and we love when Ronnie comes on the show because he is not only a wealth of information, he does not sugarcoat anything, and he's gonna tell you like it is. So start sending me your questions for Ronnie. Um, it's going to be an awesome show next week. All right, guys, as always, thank you for letting me be a part of your lives this evening. I will see you next week. Same that time, same that channel.